My, my idea for this is that we'll, obviously in an hour and a half, we can't have a really intensive bread making workshop here. But, uh, but I, that's why I made these handouts to, to give you some tips. Um, and if, if, if you guys are, are home bakers and um, looking to uh, have some, get some advice, I'm happy to, happy to give that to you. And uh, also I have uh, a starter here that, that I can give out for those of you who make bread at home and want to um, want to get a little boost with the, with the starter. Of course, a starter is only as good as the baker, uh, so it's not like uh, it's your magic bullet. But uh, blame you if it doesn't work. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Don't expect redhead for yeah. that way. Um, so. And then, uh, and then we can also take a take a walk through the through the bakery. Also, um, this at this time of day, we're sort of at the at the tail end of the um, uh, of the forming what we call the forming shift, hand, uh, forming the loaves of bread. They're on the baguettes, um, and so there's some things to see there. There isn't any mixing going on, um, and then there's some baking happening in the back. So uh, we can see that. But um, I thought I'd start off by just talking about uh, natural leavening and um, and also some about the about local wheat. Am I am I good for you, Eloise? Where we're facing yeah, naturally leavened bread, we call it sometimes a mild European style sourdough. Not we don't make anything that's really a tangy San Francisco style. Um, and then uh, the hundred percent whole wheat, also a naturally leavened bread, and uh, our panel of van, which has some. Uh, local 10% of that is local Ben Gleason's um, whole wheat that's that's grown over in Bridport, um, and then the Cyrus Pringle is right here. So that's been sliced up as well. That one has a natural starter, the same starter that I, I would give you tonight if you're interested. And I brought containers for that, and uh, and it has a little bit of yeast in the in the final dough, just to make it a milder bread to distinguish it. Just just to uh, because. We didn't want it to taste exactly like other things. Um, that one's 100%? That one is 100% Vermont, yeah. And we actually make another bread uh, that you may see coming out of the oven um, that is, that's made entirely with Vermont-grown wheat. And when we can get it, uh, it also has 7% of that bread is uh, made with whole rye. And when we, get, when we can get it from Butterworks Farm, which has been spotty, uh, but about, for about six or eight months last year, uh, we were making it entire. It was another entirely local um, bread uh, because it also had Butterworks rye in it. But it always has uh, all, all of the all of the wheat flour in there, which is 93 percent of the of the bread um, is a combination of Ben Gleason's um, stone ground whole wheat and also. Uh, and we'll talk about flour a little bit more here, but the um, the rest of it is is a white flour that comes from Tom Kenyon's Aurora Farm over in um, Charlotte, and then is milled by Champlain Valley Mills over the across the lake you know, in Westport, New York. Um, so those are the breads. Uh, the, these four breads are, are what we have here. So so please help yourselves. Um, so you know, just to talk about about uh, natural leavening um, and and wheat, and you know, uh, I, I'm not really sure if maybe this is this is fading a little bit, but boy, in the last uh, year or two, we've been hearing all kinds of questions. You know, was, uh, at the farmers market when I go on Saturdays, it's all it, you know, half a dozen people usually are saying, "Do you have anything wheat free?" Well, oh no, I'm avoiding wheat. And you know, we're hearing a lot about about wheat. It's kind of uh, gotten the Reputation of being something to avoid. I mean, you know, wheat—the the, the key ingredient there being gluten, which is uh, has been my friend for a long time. Uh, you know, you can't you can't make uh, leavened bread without without gluten, um, and because that's what's trapping the gases uh, and making making the bread rise. Uh, there is, you know, obviously I have an opinion. Obviously I'm biased. Um, there, of course. People with celiac disease uh, have a serious issue, and um, and I'm not going to make any dietary recommendations. I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to say uh, what what is good and what is bad. But you know, when you when it gets to the point where uh, you have things like ketchup or 
you know, pickles saying gluten-free, you know, things that never had <laughs> wheat in them to begin with, uh, you start to think, well, okay, so what is it that's going on here that, that, that uh, in, culturally that has made people decide that wheat in general for everyone is just a bad thing? Uh, there was a book that you may have heard of called Wheat Belly that was uh, published within the last few years that um, was written by a doctor who, who really does think that people would just be better off uh, if, they avoided, if they avoided wheat. They'd lose weight, they'd uh, have, just be generally more healthy. And I uh, feel that all, all throughout this, I've been feeling strongly that the deal is what are we doing to the wheat? You know, uh, there's, there's all kinds of foods that, that I don't get, some of them that, that, I, that I avoid if I'm going to the grocery store, uh, and some of them uh, have wheat in them, some of them don't. I, my feeling is the processing of any food has a uh, tremendous effect on its uh, taste, but also its, uh, on its nutrition. And so um, one of the things that's not so much in Vermont, but in a lot of the country is, has been sort of forgotten is, is the way we made bread uh, when, when bread, when leavened bread was first made, which is what we refer to here as naturally leavened bread. And uh, it's often sourdough in, in, in America, we usually call it sourdough. I find that confusing because, first of all, we, we associate that with, with San Francisco. That style of sourdough is, is great. It's, it's a uh, tangy or, you know, it's truly sour, as the name implies. Um, but the, the naturally leavened bread tradition uh, for the most part, for these style of breads, certainly that we make, started in Europe. Um, and they don't, their word, Levan and French and uh, all, all European languages have, have a word for naturally leavened bread and, and none of them have anything to do with sour. Uh, the idea behind those bread traditions is that they, there's a balance of flavors. Uh, you're tasting the wheat, hopefully first and foremost, and depending on what bread it is and, and how you're managing your starter and what various ingredients are being put in there, there, may, there's, there will be a degree of sourness, um, but it's probably not the dominant flavor. Uh, and there's some sweetness and some nuttiness and you know, hopefully uh, a complexity there that um, is, in my opinion, a little, um, there's a little less complexity in a bread that is, that is uh, overly sour. So. Um, our, our breads are inspired by, by that European tradition of, of uh, natural leavening. And then I, I printed out, I, I only printed one of these sheets out, but um, this, this little thing that talks about the benefits of, of sourdough uh, preparation. Um, what's happening here, in the same way that uh, yogurt or cheese uh, or tempeh, uh, work is it involves microorganisms microorganisms that work on the food to make it more uh, beneficial uh, the, the nutrients more available to you make it more digestible the same thing is happening with with a naturally leavened bread um, particularly in the case of a bread that has any any whole wheat in it any uh, percentage of whole wheat in it you know we all know that it's a good idea to eat whole grains but uh, the fact of the matter is with wheat and with a whole lot of other whole grains, the bran in the wheat has something called phytic acid, which robs your body of calcium and a few other nutrients uh, unless it's uh, naturally fermented in some way. So uh, that the phytic acid is neutralized uh, in, the, in the natural leavening process. You know, some people will actually say that, that uh, it's not a good idea to eat whole wheat pasta, whole wheat cookies, uh, whole wheat foods that are not um, fermented in some way. Were so you going to say store something? Store-bought bread, store-bought bread does do that, will we'll extract calcium. Yeah, I mean, it, it, store-bought bread is a, is a broad term. Uh, right. uh, it depends on what store. Bread we, our bread, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, that's right. Uh, so, um, like maybe it's a Arnold. That's what it is. Yeah, I mean, when if you see yeast on the on the um, ingredient list, that's unnatural. Well, you could. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't usually use that term, but but uh, it's. I mean, just to talk about that for a second, the 
the, there is yeast in uh, a naturally leavened bread, but it's actually a wild yeast in combination with a beneficial bacteria. And that's the real key, is that those two are existing symbiotically. One creates the right environment for the other to, to exist in. And we don't, in the case of the, these breads, we make some breads that have a small amount of, of yeast in them, but, but these naturally leavened ones don't have some purchased yeast that we're, that we're adding to it. You can quite easily, and, and this is talked about a little bit in, in the handouts that I gave you, you can quite easily create the culture, a, a, a natural starter, by uh, mixing flour and water together. It can be all kinds of different flour. Uh, you know, rye flour is what I like to use if I'm starting from scratch because it, it really ferments quite readily, whole rye flour um, and water. I mean, this is how, undoubtedly, this is how they first discovered that uh, you could, that this is what you could do, you know, that you, that you can make bread with this. Uh, you know, there are all kinds of, of uh, foods out there that, that are, are naturally fermented. And, and when people, it, it's very connected to the beginnings of agriculture. Uh, obviously, in the, in the Fertile Crescent, grains were, uh, that's, that's where grain were first grown. Uh, were first cultivated, and when people started doing that uh, and started eating things with them, they, they found that the bread tasted better if it was fermented. And then, and the only way, of course, in those days, before you could just buy yeast somewhere, the only way to get it to be leavened was to, was to make a starter. So it wasn't until, uh, you know, so five or 6,000 years after, after people had been baking leavened bread, that uh, they discovered, we're talking the late 1800s, that they discovered that you, could, that you could produce yeast in a laboratory environment, and then they started doing that in, in factories. And, uh, and then you could just do yeast in the absence of bacteria and uh, leaven the bread that way. It would at least, it was a microorganism that would do something a lot like what natural leavening does. Uh, and so at first people were like, oh, this is great. You know, we don't have to go through this whole process of making a starter and keeping that alive and, and all of that and, uh, and, and waiting several hours for it to rise. It'll just, you just have this yeast and boom, you've got it very quickly. And then they said, well, you know, it actually, it, some people started to realize it doesn't taste like anything, you know, uh, for one thing. Uh, and then there are the, the health effects, which goes back to what you had said. Will you make copies of that for us? You can take, can oh, of this here? Yeah. Sure, I can do that. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. That would be yeah. Um, so, you know, one of, the, one of the things that they say in here is breakdown of gluten. I mean, this is, this, I just got this off the web. It's from this place called realfoodforager.com. And uh, it's uh, the longer soaking and rising times in the preparation of sourdough breaks the, pr the protein gluten into amino acids, making it more digestible. So then we go back to this, what about wheat and gluten and all of that. Uh, we certainly can't say that this is gluten-free bread in the way that this cheese can be called lactose-free, you know? I mean, it's, you know, when you see lactose-free cheese in, in, advertised it that way, any aged cheese is lactose-free. I mean, they're just making light of the fact, as in, for marketing purposes, that uh, it's lactose-free. The chev is not. That's a fresh cheese. But um, so, you know, that has actually broken the lactose down. But, but this has, but I, it's my belief that it naturally leavened bread has broken the, the gluten down into its amino acids to make it more available to you. I mean, I, I really feel like not only with, with bread, but with, with so many other foods, this is the way uh, we were sort of meant to eat, you know. Uh, this is, you know, somebody, a friend of mine put it interestingly uh, when I was talking to him a couple, a baker friend of mine was, was saying, uh, it's interesting how with, with the dawn of agriculture, humans started eating a lot fewer, uh, there was a lot less diversity uh, in terms of the different plants and animals that they were that they were eating, you know, because they weren't foraging uh, for all kinds of different things, they started focusing on growing certain crops. But uh, in order to be to be healthy, it seems that we need to to have the diversity coming from on the microfloral level. Uh, an interesting little way of way of uh, expressing it. But that's uh, it is something that is entirely connected to 
the beginnings of, of agriculture. It's one of the reasons why I'm fascinated with, with bread making, because uh, it really goes back to, to that. But if we're talking about something that goes back to the, uh, to the early days of bread making, it's, it's, naturally, it's naturally leavened bread that, that does that. Um, and I'm interested, you know, like I said, we make some breads out of, um, with a small amount of, of uh, yeast in them, but they still, uh, they, they still make use of fermentation and uh, you know fairly long fermentation and starters or what we call pre-ferments that uh, build flavor and texture into the bread. So um, that's kind of a general introduction to the whole the whole natural leavening thing. Um, to bring it around to uh, the the current uh, agricultural landscape in Vermont specifically, um, I just wanted to talk about about the. Um, the local wheat and the, and the farmers that we work with who are growing wheat here in Vermont, um, this is a challenging place to grow wheat, uh, or to grow, to grow uh, many grains. Uh, specifically with wheat, the big issue is rainfall. Uh, last year was a, an unusually good year. I mean, it was probably hard for somebody like you growing out in the field, but uh, for, for somebody growing wheat, it was, uh, it was a great year because it was from uh, how many inches of rain do you think we had from uh, the beginning of May to the end of July? <laughs> Actually stopped about the 1st of July and then it didn't rain again for quite a while. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's the thing is that you want to have it, you want to have it dry uh, when the wheat is, is reaching maturity and it very rarely is here uh, in Vermont. Ben Gleason, one of the growers that we buy from, Delivers it here every uh, delivers flour to us every three or four weeks in this truck, and he was and he was talking to me last week when he was uh, when he was delivering, and he's feeling pretty discouraged about this year's crop with all this rain. You know, it's it's going to be real tough for him to get a to get very much yield. There was the hope is, and it, it's been done before that ten thousand acres of wheat was grown in Champlain Valley alone right. in the eighteen hundreds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting, and you know the reason that that went away is there's a few interesting reasons we can uh, obviously that when the Erie Canal opened up and uh, it became possible to bring things from first Ohio and then further out in the Midwest uh, that obviously made it harder for for it to, to be feasible here in Vermont but the other thing was that they didn't know enough uh, as much as they do now about nutrient management and they really burned the soils out pretty quickly uh, and so they started to get diseases that were related to the to the fact that the that the soils were not um, being replenished, and so they had some failed crops, really a little bit before uh, they had the uh, the competition from the Midwest. So uh, it's certainly possible. Obviously, it's possible. The land is there to grow 10,000 acres of wheat, which is still a drop in the bucket, um, but. There are there's a there's a dedicated fairly small group of people who are who are working on bringing that back, um, and and now there's the Northern Grain Growers Association that that was formed about five years ago, and I've been involved with that um, all along, and 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 actually have been doing a lot of bake testing for them. Um, the so as I say, the, the big challenge is is rain. The other challenge is how to market this uh, and. You know, when, when you've, if you've got a fresh tomato, I mean, number one, it's fresh, uh, right? It's, it's got an obvious advantage over a Florida tomato because it's just absolutely better, no doubt about it. Uh, it's, and I think that, you know, that I'm, I'm not, this is, this is not a, a slight on uh, any of the, the local farmers. It's, it's pretty hard to, for me to say that any of these local flowers here are any better actually than, than what's out in the Midwest. Grain travels well. I mean, the fact of the matter is uh, you harvest it, you put it in a, in a silo, uh, and then you can put it on a rail car or a truck and get it out here, and by the time, and then you grind it. You know, you can grind it uh, later, before you, right before you need to bake with it. It's gonna be good, you know? So it's hard for the farmers to get the kind of price that they really need to get because of the scale that they're working at here in Vermont, um, Aurora Farms is the biggest, probably the, 
uh, the biggest grain grower uh, in the state. And they're growing on a few hundred acres. He's probably growing, uh, I think he has 200 acres of, of wheat planted, uh, winter wheat, that was, so that was planted last fall, will be harvested in July. And another couple hundred acres of corn, and he has some soybeans. And he's considered really big for, for Vermont. You know, I've been out to Kansas and, uh, and talked to organic farmers who supply the mill that we, we buy a lot of Kansas wheat from. And they have 10,000 acres, you know, just one farm. Uh, so, you know, the, kinds of, the, the kind of price that, that a small farmer is going to need to get is, is just uh, somehow, you know, cutting the middleman out helps uh, not having to deal with, the, with transporting it 2,000 miles. It cert certainly helps a lot. Ben Gleason, who grows 60 acres a year, as I said, he, loads, he mills it himself. He loads it in his pickup truck brings it over here directly to us and, and to all the other places that he sells to. We buy about half of what he grows. But um, that's uh, still, it, it's marginal for him uh, as, as a business uh, because he can't really justify charging more than, than Midwestern prices. Um, Jack Laser up in, at Butterworks Farm, who I mentioned earlier, we get rye from. Uh, He's making his money off of yogurt, you know. So uh, that's a value-added product. Think about the Vermont that you have noticed? Well, um, one of the I, I guess the way I would answer that is that um, a few years ago, a couple of years ago now, uh, I had been talking to Ben Gleason about getting a bolter, which is the the miller's term for a sifter. It's, the the term comes from bolts of cloth because that's what's used. That's uh, there's various uh, uh, densities of, of, of weave uh, of the cloth that's used in, uh, in, this, in this apparatus. And uh, this is a very old, old method that uh, is a way of getting a certain amount of the bran out. And you can vary that amount by using various screens. Um, and I was saying that I'd be able to use more of his flour if, if he was able to, to sift some of the bran out. Um, so he started doing that a few years ago. I'll pass this around. This is uh, the darker one is his whole wheat. Uh, and then the, the lighter one is his bolted flour. Same, you know, it started out as the same wheat, whole wheat berry. Um, but when you bolt it, it gets a little bit lighter. Um, and as I say, we're, we're able to use it. it it's, you know, bran, bran gets in the way of, of gluten formation. So. Um, this is 100% whole wheat bread that, that is uh, made, 50% of that is, is from uh, Quebec grown wheat. Um, but it it's obviously makes a denser bread. So anyway, to get back to your question, I think that uh, an advantage that he, Ben Gleason has is that he can respond. He's small, he's local, uh, we matter uh, to him. We didn't used to buy half of his, um, of his grain. Uh, crop, but we started to be able to when we when we did this, and so that's different. There isn't anybody um, that's doing quite that kind of thing. But as far as um, yeah, I mean it's it's interesting. You know, we say like I, I would maybe um, make a comparison to milk. You know, where if you're talking about fluid milk, you'd probably be pretty hard pressed to take a glass of milk. I mean, I know there's, there's better milk and there's, but I'm talking the very best Wisconsin milk or even California milk or, you know, up against Vermont milk. I, I wonder if you could really taste the difference. But then the cheese, right? I mean, there's all kinds of good cheese made all over the place, but Vermont's known for making great cheese. We know that. So uh, to me, that's the beginning. The, the wheat growing and the milling is the beginning of the process. And then um, it's, yeah, I mean, they're, they're one of the, the this guy up in um, Miller up in Quebec says he works with a lot of farmers in that area and he says to them remember you're growing unbaked bread you know so we're, you know this is this is part of the process the the farming is is part of it but as far as uh, the the wheat itself you know I don't I don't know if anybody would be able to say definitively that they could they could taste a difference because it's from Vermont. Well, you can put Vermont in front of it and sell it to a lot of people. Yeah, that's true. Outside of yeah. The state. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, absolutely right.
So yeah. The, uh, what's the difference between the bolted flour, that's how you refer to it, mm -hmm. the sifted, and just regular white flour? Is it just not? Yeah. Well, here flour? I'll uh, I'll pass out I'll pass around a, the white flour here. This is this is um, milled on a roller mill, which is the way white flour is milled. Um, the, it's a very different type of process here. So in a stone ground, in a bolt, if you're talking about the stone ground bolted flour, um, that means that it was the whole wheat berry was pulverized, and part of that wheat berry uh, is like three or four percent of that wheat berry is the most nutrient dense bit of it, which is the uh, germ, and that is where all the fats are are contained and and uh, and most of the vitamins and minerals, and that. Those fats get get crushed right along with the endosperm, which makes up close to 80 percent of the that's and that's the white part, the starchy part. Uh, but when it gets rubbed right in there with the endosperm in a stone mill, it's going to be there, and it and and those uh, and, and the, it's also the source of most of the flavor in in wheat. And uh, but the bran is very hard, and um, and it turns into these these larger flaky pieces that you can see in that whole wheat sample that I that I passed around. So, uh, and the bran has fiber, um, but that's about it. Um, and not that fiber is a bad thing dietarily, but uh, Does it have B vitamins? maybe it does. I think you might be right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and as I mentioned earlier, it also has the phytic acid, which can be neutralized with natural leavening, but. Um, is not considered such a good thing if it's not natural, if it's not fermented. But um, it's easy to uh, to sift the bran off because it's an entirely different different uh, shape. It, it's it has a larger larger particle size uh, than the what has become pulverized endosperm and germ. Whereas in um, roller milling, where the goal is to make white flour, it's really peeled apart. Uh, the wheat berry is peeled apart from the outside in through, uh, it, it's called a gradual reduction mill. So usually about eight pairs of rollers um, that are each one spaced a little bit more closely together. And so the first one peels off the outer layer and then it, and it just, and then it passes through the next one. It works its way towards the inside of the berry, the wheat berry, so that it picks apart all the pieces and you can get a, fairly pure stream of bran and a uh, stream of germ. That's how you can buy wheat germ in the, in the store. Because I mentioned earlier that you know, in, in a stone mill, the germ just ends up being all part of the, part of the endosperm, which from my perspective as a baker is nice. But, um, but they're not, they want to remove the, the germ and the bran, sort of the two most uh, nutrient rich pieces of, of the wheat uh, in, in white flour. Um, so that's, to me, what's exciting about a bolted flour is that you're getting all the germ, you're getting all the endosperm, and depending on what you do with the screens, you're getting most uh, or a significant amount of, of bran in there, too. Now, this one that Ben Gleason um, makes for us, the bolted flour, which he calls Snake Mountain. It's, it's in some stores uh, around the area. I know it's in, at a Healthy Living in City Market. Uh, that has what we call, it, a miller would, would refer to that as 92% uh, extraction, which means for every 100 pounds of wheat berries that he puts in there, he's taking out 8% uh, uh, in, in brand. Uh, uh, in terms of in, in weight. The volume of bran is really, because it's this fluffy stuff, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a volume. He's sort of overwhelmed by the volume. He takes it to a farmer. But, uh, so it's, that's why it's important to, to weigh it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. I didn't know you could separate it from the ruler. Yeah, they also use a bolter in a roller mill because once they once they get those different parts, then they they have to separate them, and the means of separation is with the bolter. But um, you don't get that separate because you're talking about something that's, you know, the, the texture of white flour. You, we all know what that feels like. This this starchy part, the white part, and if you can imagine an oily uh, the the germ, the oily piece uh, is easily crushed. Uh, so it's. It's really nice to get this flour that has that uh, that flavor-containing and nutrient-containing piece 
uh, throughout it. Um, what's that? Well, with, with varying amounts of brand. And this is the other interesting thing. You know, you, I, I wanted to uh, show you these three different types of flour because we think in this country of whole wheat and white. You know, like there's two different kinds of flour, as if white flour just grew, grew naturally or something. Uh, and, uh, and, then, and then whole wheat is another thing. But in, in Europe, they have a whole classification system, and they do it differently in Italy and, uh, than they do in France. And I think in Germany, they have another way of doing it. But in, um, in France, they refer to it by, they, they will say it, type 80, type 120. This refers to the amount of bran that's in there. And people, even home bakers, know about this. And it's in the stores. And so people don't live in this white, whole wheat world. It, it, ben Gleason has had a hard, he sells most of the bolted flour to us because He's had a hard time figuring out how to market this uh, to, to people because we, we see a lot of recipes here where uh, it like, calls for 50% whole wheat. Uh, or you know the, the USDA re food regulations came out last year for schools, and, uh, and they said that it had to be at least 50% whole grain. Well, you could make a bread with 100% bolted and it's, there's actually no whole grain in there because every single bit of it was refined to a certain degree. But actually, it's more nutrient rich than a bread made with 50% whole wheat, right? Because, because all of the germ is there. Um, and depending on how it was sifted, um, it, there could be more bran. It certainly would be in this case more bran than there would be in a bread that's made with 50% white flour and 50% whole wheat. Uh, so this is because we Americans don't have a so real sense of it. that type of flour that has that the germ and the... Uh, uh, no, we make, we make plenty of bread with, with uh, roller milled white flour. Okay. Um, it's, you'll never get a true white flour uh, by bolting. And the other thing that's important to realize is that it's not... Uh, it, it's, um, it's not as efficient a process f of milling as, as roller milling is because some of that 8% that Ben is throwing out has endosperm that has clung to the bran. It's, I've seen his, his bran stream, and it's pretty, pretty pure, but it has uh, some, some endosperm in it. So if you tried to get even further with it and make it, make it wider, you start to lose a lot more, and, uh, and the yield... The, the yield on 100 pounds of, um, of the, the yield in white flour on 100 pounds of wheat is about 75%. That's with a roller mill. If you tried to get this white, you never would get this white, and you'd start to get down to maybe 60% yield or something like that with it if you were, if you were bolting. So in my opinion, uh, the, thing, the thing to do is uh, figure out a reasonable place to, to take it to refinement-wise. Um, with with the bolting. So when they talk about whole grain, I'm sorry, but they're talking about wheat that has the bran left in it. That's right. Now whole grain, and you know, this is tough because sometimes you will see what I would sometimes refer to as store-bought bread, as you, you know, use, use that term earlier. Uh, bread out there made, mass-produced bread that, that says 100% whole wheat. And then you look, and, and it actually has uh, something like, it often has gluten flour added into it, which is like the most refined type of flour you can, you can get. I mean, it's like refined white flour, uh, just, to make it, just to make it rise more. For some reason, they can get away with that. And, I mean, truly, whole grain bread uh, should not have anything, and, and whole wheat flour should not have anything but everything i mean it's just it's just ground up wheat berries you know and it can't nothing can be taken out otherwise it's not whole wheat i mean it this and in my opinion you shouldn't even be saying whole wheat bread if it, but you see a lot of whole wheat breads out there that that say whole wheat bread you know and then it, and then you look and the first ingredient is unbleached wheat flour like, you know that, that's white flour i mean th it might be a good bread but it doesn't have anything it it's, it's a misnomer, in my opinion. So you bake with uh, the bolted white flour, bolted flour that's ran free. 
how do you categorize that? Is that well, you'll never get it brand free completely, well, you know, but you, yeah. So how do you categorize it? I don't know. I mean, you know, you and, and, and Ben Gleason would love to have a good name for you it. Think of it as a white flour. I mean, if you, you no, it, it doesn't it. bake anything like a white flour. It bakes a little bit more like a whole wheat flour, but truly, it bakes like what it is, which is in between. Um, and we, I've done a lot of tests when I, when I. When we've been testing the, the wheat for UVM from their test plots, we have Ben Millet on, the, uh, on his mill and bolt it in just this way. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's flour that looks like this. It's a lot easier for, me, for us to make this style of bread uh, hun with, with that, 100%. Uh, you know, we, we, we don't put any, any white flour in there. And it's not like baking white bread. It's not as uh, like baking whole wheat bread. You know, it, it is lighter, um, but it has tremendous flavor. Um, and so like the Cyrus Pringle, could, that can be 100% bolted flour? It's, it's not. That one is uh, our Cyrus Pringle bread, this one here, that, that is, um, that's 15% bolted flour. And the rest is, the rest is this white. Here. We're not making a bread that's all bolted um, <clears throat> simply because I, it's costly. hard to, yeah, it is a little bit costly, but, but it more has to do with the fact that like our cross at Hill, and our, which we also make in our uh, miche, the big round loaf, um, that one has the highest percentage of the bolted flour in it. Um, and I, it, it has, we're, we're up against the same marketing challenge. That uh, that Ben is, you know, in trying to we can we can use more of his flour uh, in our in our breads when it's bolted, but then uh, th to go to 100 percent, it's a matter of distinguishing it and and um, being able to say, oh, this is this is something that's different than uh, y you know this one, the the panel of Anne. Uh, at a certain point. How much are people going to appreciate that we have a 100% whole wheat bread, and then we have this one that has a little bit less, and then a little bit more? So it has to do with that. How can we correlate the Yeah, you mean on our ingredient list? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it says uh, sifted. I think I'm. I think I'm right that I have it listed. It's sifted, <laughs> sifted wheat flour. Um, Stone ground sifted wheat flour. That's what I say. Yeah, stone ground and sifted because nobody knows what bolted means. So yeah. I say sifted. Yeah. And then like, and you also buy some sort of you know ordinary white flour. Yep, and that says unbleached wheat flour. Yeah. Unbleached. Yeah, and that's an interesting term, but you know uh, that is you'll, that's pretty universal. Uh, it's. And you use a lot of blends. Right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, in most cases, it's, it's blended. Um, Can I go back to the fermenting? Yeah. The leavening? Yeah. So to differentiate naturally from unnaturally leavening, yeah. um, does it, is it the, the time that the entire bread is, is rising and fermenting that counts? Or is it, I mean, when I've made bread in the past, the best bread that I've made is always with a Polish. Mm hmm. So Polish, yeah. Mm hmm. <laughs> sure. Yeah, Polish. yeah. And so that, that can sit around for whatever. Yeah. And, and that has a little bit of yeast in it. Yeah. Yeah. It has a teeny, weeny, weeny right. bit of yeast. Mm hmm. It hangs around for a day if I get to it, or yeah. three days if I don't. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but then when I make the actual loaf, That's right, and that's, yeah, that's the way it should be. The starter goes for, uh, depending on how you manage it, it can go for three to four times as long as the bread goes. Um, and really, the more whole grains that you have in the bread, uh, and especially whole rye, the, uh, the touchier it's going to be, the, the less it will tolerate a long fermentation in the final dough. So you want to have more of your fermentation happening in the starter in those cases. And so in other words, there's uh, a higher percentage of starter uh, and, and then a shorter fermentation of the final dough. But still plenty of time for it to um, leaven it properly, for it to uh, really be, be fermented. But, um, but that, like, the, those threads that people make at home, you know, with the Polish, you're not adding 
adding bacteria except what no. comes off your hands yeah. or whatever. It's, so, so that's different. It is different, here, yeah. Right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, and that's a great way of making bread. It's a different style. You know, that's a hybrid. I, I mentioned how, I mean, I, I, I'm sort of guessing here, but, the, but uh, I mentioned how when, when yeast first came along, initially, you know, when you could buy it, like in the store kind of thing, I think initially people thought, oh, great, you know, like I said earlier, now I can just make bread really fast. And then they said, oh, wait a second, you know, this has lost some of that flavor. So then they came up with, Aside from going back to natural leavening, there also became this whole family of interesting breads and starters made with um, a, a kind of a hybrid method with a really small amount of yeast um, and, and letting that and making a starter with that small amount of yeast. That's how we make our baguettes. That's the only yeasted starter that we, that we use, but it's, it's like the process that you just mentioned. And that builds all kinds of flavor. It's, far superior, in my opinion, flavor-wise, uh, to just what we call a straight dough, where there is no, no pre-fermented flour in there. But uh, it's still a very different flavor than a naturally leavened bread. So how, where do you get, where do you, where do you start? Well, you can start, you can, you can take it, I'll, you can take it home here tonight if you want, but, but there really is, you know, I, I also, uh, I, I really like to debunk any, uh, so, it's folklore is great, you know, and uh, and it's fun to tell a story about the starter and you know that you got it from some somebody's great grandmother, and that that's meaningful in its own way. But uh, if we're going to be scientific about it, uh, I started the starter that that we used when we started the bakery a couple months before we started the bakery, you know, that summer because I didn't feel like keeping it around while I was worried about buying equipment and getting our building ready and all that, you know, it's, it's easy to get something fermenting. And the easiest way, as I had said earlier, is to use whole rye and some warm water, make sure it's uh, in the low 80s, both the, the mixture that you make and the environment you put it in. And you, in a day, you'll come back and it, it'll be bubbling. And that's the beginning. And you, then you go through, and I, and I described that in the, um, I think it's in, yeah, in the recipe for French miche. Uh, and in about three weeks, you can have a mature starter. Uh, it does require, especially in those early stages, that you are throwing out, you're wasting a lot of food. <laughs> you're wasting a lot of flour, because otherwise it'll just take over the world. You know, it's that, that whole friendship, uh, bread, people have seen that a lot, right? You know, you give that, that bag. That's just a way of, a fun way of, um, feeding a starter and, and giving it away. Because if you, we make, you know, every time we feed the starter, it's, it's uh, we, we, we uh, increase it by about five times what it was. So um, you have to start with a very small amount. I mean, even for making a couple thousand loaves, it's remarkable, you know, it's like uh, two or three gallons, two or three by volume uh, of, of starter that within 24 hours can be elaborated to make uh, literally 2,000 loaves of bread. Um, so even when you're continually feeding a starter, it needs to, it needs to have lots of, it, it needs to have this regular feeding, you know, it's, it's a living thing. And um, that's why it can be tricky if you're not, uh, a, you know, a bake, baking regularly with it. Uh, it can be tricky to figure out what to do with it. It can be frozen, it can be, some people dehydrate it. Uh, it can be refrigerated for, in my opinion, not much more than a week. Uh, but then, in all of those cases, it needs to have several feedings to bring it back to, uh, to its full vigorous self, that, that, that in it, to a state that's really ready to make bread with it. Absolutely, yeah. We use, we use five different, we make five different natural starters. Uh, I'll just go get this one that's, that's here. Um, what you were doing, I, I think it's important for, uh, this, this is just a shortcut for you. you know, if you knew what you were doing, you could get to this point in three weeks, as I said earlier. Uh, and if you don't know what you're doing, this will be no good in two days. Uh, so 
this is that's all that's the only value in this you know it's it's much more of a process than than uh, an ingredient thing and there are I believe that at King Arthur you can you can go and get uh, starter it, you know some dehydrated thing and there's nothing special about it you know the special part is what you do and putting and the flowers that you that you use have a big big influence on it this is um, this is the one that we make for, that we use for our Cyrus Pringle bread. Um, it's about uh, four and a half hours old right now. Um, you may get a little a a aroma. Since feeding. since feeding, that's what I mean to say. Yeah, uh, that's that's that flour that I had passed around earlier, the bolted, with water, and obviously a bunch of microorganisms that um, you can't see, um, but are really making the magic there. We'll give the camera a good shot here. <laughs> um, that's why it's bubbly. This is equal parts by weight, flour and water. Um, it was fed uh, two and a half pounds each of um, flour and water and uh, one pound of mature starter. So in another, you wouldn't want to let this go for more than about six hours without doing something to it, either putting it in the refrigerator for, as I say, not more than a week, uh, or feeding it again, uh, or perhaps freezing it. Um, so, you know, sometimes I say it's, it, it's, we sometimes like to refer to ourselves as yeast farmers, uh, and, you know, it's a little bit like milking the cows or something, you know, it, it really, we, we feed our starter at noon and at midnight every day, and it's, it's critical. It's not, uh, it's not just for fun, <laughs> and, and we feed it flour and water. And then, uh, to get back to that a little bit, you know, th this starter um, will, if we're managing it properly, will bring out the flavors of that bolted flour. Um, we make another starter that's entirely rye flour for our rye breads, and that brings out all kinds of flavors in the rye. Um, this. This bread here, the Waitsfield Common, is a naturally leavened bread, but that's just, that's got a white, it's just a starter with white flour, so it's a lot milder. Um, and then you can, you can do a combination um, of things. The other thing that happens is if you make it, uh, you can make it dough consistency. And in my opinion, you get something that's a, a, a bit more complex. A, you could say it's a bit more sour, but I feel like it's just, it's just a kind of a rounder flavor. Um, not, um, it, just a little bit more assertive uh, when it's a when it's dough consistency because you're encouraging different different acids um, to to form just by varying the uh, percentage of water that's in there. So in wine making, yeah, it's important. And there's sort of two schools of thought. One is you take a known yeast that has, if you put grape juice in with it it will produce certain chemical byproducts that have a particular flavor, flavor profile. The other way of doing it is just taking your mush of grape juice and letting it sit in the cellar, whatever happens to be in the cellar or in the fields, becomes the yeast that causes the fermentation. Do people do that regularly? I don't know enough about winemaking. Yes. So no. those, are, those, wow. two, those are two different approaches. So some people will take a particularly successful wine and take the yeast that seems to have been creating that wine and clone it. Uh -huh. You can buy that yeast and yes, put it sure. make, put it, mix it with grapes and make your own wine. But there's plenty of very successful, very expensive wines where they just take this mush of grapes and they let it sit in the cellar and either stuff that came from the fields or stuff that was in the cellar is what becomes the yeast that ferments, the, yeah. you know, makes alcohol and different esters. And it's the chemicals that the individual yeast produces that vary from place to place. Mm -hmm. It always struck me, it's pretty bizarre that they're gonna invest this huge amount of work and time and money into a wine, and then just hope that the yeast shows up and it's a random good one. Yeah. But it does. So well, that's what you do. You you have yeah. yeast and it, wherever mm -hmm. it comes from, it comes from, and yeah. you feed it right, and it produces the flavor. From yeah. The well, it's interesting, and you know, they're still working on. Uh, there's there's still a lot of research being done on on naturally leavened bread and figuring out where does it come from. For one thing, we all know that. You know, the, uh, on apples or grapes, uh, that little film on the outside, it, that's yeast. So uh, grain has yeah. that too. Um, but then where's the bacteria coming from? You know, that's important. 
some people think it's from the baker's hands. Right. You know, this was mixed by Well, hand. they must know what the bacteria are. Have they yes. identified the name? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, in this case, it's, uh, it's Lactobacillus San Franciscus. San Francisco. Like, yeah. <laughs> no, really, so because, Lactobacillus is a pretty yeah. common... It's a Lactobacillus. Yeah. yeah. And then that it's combines... It's in our gut, with, right? It's in our GI yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. You know, there is a difference with bread uh, versus yogurt um, because because these things are these microorganisms are killed in the baking process. You know? So it's important to realize that what we're talking about is the way that they work on the grain and make it more digestible. You're not getting living uh, as you as you are with yogurt. Uh, you're not getting those things put in. But it's true. They are the. They, we do have lactobacillus in us because we, we, we rely on it. You know, we're finding this out now that uh, it's almost like an organ unto itself. Think, isn't that an acid producer? That is, I think that's an acid producer. Maybe contributing to the lactic acid. Well, you, it produces lactic and acetic acid in the in a sourdough starter. Yeah, and and that's what you know uh, by by changing the percentage of water in there or the temperature. If we leave it in a colder place, it gets more acetic acid. Um, if we if it's warmer, it gets more lactic acid, um, and that's and those acids have different flavors. So that's what fascinates me is that you know we can do all this. It, the bread ing the ingredients on many of our different breads look the same. You would think, how can this bread be any different? But it starts with the starter as far as uh, distinguishing one from the other, uh, and and how you how you manage that to to create different flavors and the texture also. <laughs> Yeah. It's all N yeah. And, mm -hmm. and serum and Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Which is what um, commercial yeast is too. Yeah. But um, do you know if the um, proportions of the two are different in your different starters? Do you have any idea? Oh, in I would doubt it. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's it's. Uh, Some food might favor one over the other. You know, like in the like, yeah. Like Brian, like, you might promote the mo mo growth of more bacteria and versus and less yeast. yeast. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it depends on what you're talking. About. You know, we try to get a certain flavor profile, and we try to get the maximum rise out leavening power out of the starter. So we're. It's one of those things where we don't know exactly what we're in touch with, but we're at least in touch with something. You know, okay, it's at its peak. So whatever it is. It's, I would imagine it's pretty consistent, you know, whatever that ratio is. Um, yeah, that's what we're looking for. You know, as I say, this is, this is, I can tell just from the smell of this that if I was to bake with it, I'd want it to go for another hour or two, you know. Uh, but then in another hour or two after that, it's going to be a little past its prime, you know. And then, as I said, another few hours after that, and it starts to be like, even beyond when you should have fed it, you know, and you can bring it back. Uh, you could probably this could probably sit for another 24 hours, and then with a couple feedings, you can bring it back to this strength. Um, but you know, those things are they're working all the time. They're they're consuming their food uh, quite rapidly and, and multiplying uh, quite rapidly. Yeah. So what do you think about recipes that call for a combination of starter and commercial yeast? Oh, I think they're really interesting and, and it's fun. And uh, that's why, aside from the fact that the, the sour sprinkle is our entirely local, one of our entirely local breads, um, I included that one here tonight because that one has yeast in the final dough. And when we first, the first year that that, that, that uh, recipe kind of grew out of what we were dealing with in the first year that, um, that Tom Kenyon grew wheat for us and uh, and had a harvest that was that gave that yielded flour that was good enough to work with, but still a little bit challenging. And one of the challenges was just getting enough loft out of it. And um, and so the way we did that was to put a little bit of yeast in, in the final dough. And that also in turn made it milder. So uh, you know, in an indirect way, the Vermont um, ingredients that we were working with had an influence on the flavor of the final bread, but it was it was because of it was it was kind of a byproduct of uh, the, the flavor was a byproduct of just 
making this into, into bread. Since then, he's, used, he's been growing another variety of, of wheat, and it uh, is a lot easier to work with, and that's why we're able to make the, our other bread, the Crossing Hill, out of, um, out of the local wheat. Um, and that was a bread that we were making previously. We're just using the same, same recipe, different ingredients. Um, so now I can't even remember what your question was. <laughs> so is it kind of a cop out to do that? Oh, a cop out. Oh, no. so you, I don't think so. No. Uh, you know, it's, we talked about, about starters that have yeast in them. Uh, you know, that, that's one way of, of doing it. Uh, this is a bread that is, has a natural starter, but then a little yeast in the final dough. If, if you feel, for whatever reason, that uh, you'd like a bread that has a, a thinner crust, isn't quite as chewy, uh, isn't, uh, the, the flavor isn't quite as assertive, that's a way to do it, you know, but still, but still has some of the characteristics of a, uh, of a natural, naturally leavened bread. I think it's an interesting thing to do. Uh, I, in my opinion, there are no cop-outs or shortcuts or bad ways to make handmade bread with basic ingredients. You know, I mean that to me is where I draw the line. You know, I, there are certain things I just don't like to put in bread um, or certain uh, types of flour. Like I mentioned, gluten flour earlier. I, I, you know, that to me is a cop-out uh, and and is never going to make good the kind of bread I want to make. So I don't think that, I, I'm, as, as excited as I am about naturally leavened breads, I'm, uh, I'm certainly interested in making breads with, with yeast, but in every case it's a very small amount of yeast relative to your average yeasted bread recipe that you find. So, um, we yeah, we can do a little tour and, um, that's, what time that's we have? It's uh, 25 to 7, so we still oh, okay. have like 25 minutes. Perfect. Um, are there other questions before we before we do that? I was actually interested in how you make the swirls. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, that that's a perfect segue into the tour, because I'll show you uh, how that's done. And if I don't remember, you can remind me, but uh, we'll see. We'll see that. We are getting ready for um, the what we refer to as the sponge, that's a baker's term for a particular yeasted starter that we use for the um, baguettes. So uh, in the bowl, in the big mixing bowl right there uh, is what looks like dough. That's the, that's the sponge, so that's actually the starter uh, for the baguettes. Now, uh, yeasted starters, because you're starting from, you're, you, don't have, you don't have that natural starter that, that you're carrying over from generation to generation, uh, you're, you're kind of starting from scratch in terms of fermentation and, and building flavor. So yeasted starters go for a much longer time. They sit for a much longer time than natural starters do. So we're making that now. Um, it will sit and ferment for um, four hours out, out here at, at, in this room, and uh, which is at 73 degrees all the time. And the dough itself is at 70, the starter itself is at 73 degrees. And then it will actually go into the refrigerator for another uh, about 15 hours before it gets used in the in the dough the next day. And for all of that dough, uh, all of that starter that's there, this is uh, probably 250 pounds in there. Uh, yeah, 250 or 275 pounds. There's about uh, a few ounces of yeast in there, three or four ounces. Yeah, so it's. There, it, and, and after four hours, it's just barely started to, started to rise, and then it finishes it off. It, it, it finishes its process in the cooler. And as I said earlier, colder temperature encourages acetic acid, um, which in my, my feeling is that, that that builds more flavor into a, into a natural starter. I don't like to encourage that extra acetic acid in a, in a natural starter, uh, because I think there's just plenty of it naturally. Um, so that's what's going on right here. Uh, potatoes are getting right, weighed out for our uh, potato bread. Those, of course, the, the previous to uh, being able, before we were able to get much in the way of grains from uh, Vermont farmers, potatoes were one thing that, that, I, that we, we've been putting in bread since the beginning, uh, in our one potato bread. Uh, we've been getting those from Footbrook Farm, Yukon Gold Potatoes, uh, and he, he grows them. And, stores them for us and, and has done a great job uh, 
keeping them from, from sprouting all the way right till, uh, till the next harvest. So uh, those are getting weighed out for tomorrow's mix. They get weighed out now so that when we uh, mix the dough, somebody will be here tomorrow morning at 7 to mix the dough. Uh, and we want those at room temperature so it doesn't, doesn't throw the temperature of the dough off. You know, this is something else that's really critical is that, uh, the, as I mentioned with the starter, you, you're paying attention to the temperature there, but then of course with the final dough as well. Uh, we, we know how many hours it needs to rise in order to be uh, at, its, at its proper, proper level uh, when it goes on to the next step and we inform it to a loaf. Uh, and, and so we have to get the dough temperature right and the room temperature is always consistent. Uh, so baking is uh, kind of equal parts uh, art and science, if you will. You know, it's, uh, you, you really uh, have, to, have to keep track of. Everything is weighed. I have that, that niche formula in, in cups and uh, it, it's, it's much better if you have a scale. If, you, if you're really into baking, to have a scale and to be measuring your ingredients by weight obviously they'll vary uh, depending on how much they're settled. So um, further down there, they're, um, they're making the baguettes, uh, which is sort of a two-stage two process. They're dividing them um, with a divider that, that takes a, a pre-weighed amount of dough and divides it quickly into 24 equal pieces without squishing too much air out of it. And then um, we do have, this is the one place for, for baguettes because they're, they're a pretty labor intensive thing to make and about half of our, uh, to make by hand, and about half of our production units wise on a daily basis is baguettes. Uh, we have a machine that, that, uh, that you'll see used there that rolls them out. Uh, and everything else that happens all previous to this in the day is, uh, is hand formed. The, um, the schedule, our schedule, because we're making anywhere from 1,500 to 3,000 loaves a day, our schedule here is, uh, it, and most of these are going to stores and restaurants. We start uh, mixing the dough in the morning, uh, and those are all the naturally leavened ones, and they uh, ferment for about four hours, uh, and then at 11 o'clock we have people, people start to, to uh, hand form the, those loaves of bread, and then uh, those will rise for several hours more and at 4.30 p.m. people come in uh, and start putting bread into the oven and they're doing that pretty much all night long and then there's time for the bread to cool and get packed up and, uh, and be ready for the, to hit the road at 5 in the morning when, the, when it, we go to the stores and restaurants. So we're sort of a, sort of a backward schedule to what people normally think of as baker's hours. Um, so what, I'll, what we'll do here, it's a little, little tight in there. Um, I think way to take a group this size is to um, head through here we'll kind of we'll take a left and maybe we'll it's, it's somewhat loud in there so it might be a little hard to hear me I don't know so this is yeah there's, there's this is what we call proofing the final the final rise is called proofing you can keep on coming through here so the answer to the question about the uh, pattern on the loaf is right here. Um, and that's connected to your other question about uh, how are those, uh, you say, were they baked? I was wondering on that? if they were baked in. Yeah. yeah, no. So what happens is there are two different methods that we use for uh, holding, holding the breads up so that they, they maintain their shape while they're rising, their, in their final rise. And uh, one is with these, which is called a bra form, this is in German. Uh, cane basket made specifically for proofing, proofing bread in. And uh, so it, it, it rises upside down there. Uh, and then, and, and one of the reasons for that is that that, that will keep it from drying out on the, on the surface of it. Uh, and it's okay if it dries a little bit here because what happens on, on what is to be the bottom is you flip it out and then it won't stick uh, to the heart because these, these breads are all baked directly on the stone heart. And the alternative method is for, for a bread that's shaped like a baguette or anything that's long and skinny is to use what's, what the French call a couche, C-O-U-C-H-E, 
the CHE, and that's made from linen, uh, and that's just, you know, you can see they're creased, and, they, and then each one holds, holds its neighbor up. Uh, once again, they're, they're grooved upside down, and then, and then flipped over before they, they're put into the oven. Uh, all of our bread spent on most days, depends on, depends on if, uh, how much bread we have to bake and when we, when we need them to go into the oven, but uh, in, most of the time they'll spend a little bit of time in the, in the cooler, which is over there in the corner, uh, which just holds them for not more than two or three hours, uh, and, it, and, then, and then we can, we can have our oven just continually full because we have bread that's risen and ready to go. Uh, in storage, essentially. There. So you've got to give those a heavy yeah. flour? Yes, yeah, so these get, um, it's a balance, you know, you don't want so much flour that it's, you're going to get a mountain of flour every time you eat a slice of bread, but uh, enough so that it won't stick. So it's not, it's not real heavy. Yeah. This is actually rattan that's uh, made, you know, they make um, furniture sometimes out of that, you know. Uh, and then we recently bought some that are, uh, they just roll away. Oh, there they are. Moving over that way, that are uh, they're like they're like some kind of sophisticated paper mache. They're they're also made in Germany, and they're uh, they're uh, wood chips that, that are just like pressed together, and they seem quite durable. Uh, and then they have a little pattern on them, which not only makes a pattern, you know, it's there for making a pattern, but it will stick less if it has some texture to it. Uh, so this or, or the linen, or whatever. No, we don't. You can do that. You know, it depends on. We don't. We don't use a proof box. A lot of bakeries uh, are rather than slowing down the fermentation. Their schedule is such that they need to speed up the fermentation, which can work fine. It's just that uh, a proof box is very humid, and then you will have the bottom of the loaves get better off at that point, get get sticky, and then maybe you'll need to add. Some I prefer semolina because it's more flavor neutral, but uh, cornmeal is often used too. Semolina, which is uh, it, it really, it's a coarse ground Durham wheat. Uh, it's a hard, hard wheat. Yeah, or it's an Italian pasta flour. Or yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's a that's a nice thing. It, it's 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 a little sandy kind of. Uh, so we'll move into the oven room here, and then a and then a seat, you know, tray full of seeds. That's it. Yeah, no glue involved. <laughs> so you probably want to just come back a little. I know it's a big group for for a small space, so I'm sorry to have to squish you guys in here. But, um, you know, I mentioned earlier about about uh, the beginnings of bread baking. The other thing, of course, is the oven, uh, and. Uh, you know, I like I like to refer to this as, as a modern version of the of the, the first types of ovens that, that bread is baked on. Uh, beneath all that steel, there's uh, a whole lot, several tons of uh, of brick and and refractory concrete, and uh, it's all in an effort to create enough thermal mass so that when you put the loaves on the baking surface, uh, they'll uh, they'll spring. Uh, they, they, the baking surface won't cool down. That's what happens. They just put some, put some bread directly onto the, uh, onto the hearth. And as with uh, Dave Hartshorn's uh, more primitive version of the same thing, the, the, the principle is, is the same um, in a hearth oven. The heat is hot. The air is not moving uh, in any significant way like it would be in a convection oven. And so you get a natural contrast uh, as you get to, you know, if the loaf flares at all, it gets it gets darker. That's something we want. We want that that variability in the in the crust color because the heat is more intense towards the outside, towards the top and the sides of the of the oven. Um, and we bake at uh, 400, about 480 degrees. You know, it fluctuates 10 degrees or so. Um, and this is, you know, the, the early ovens, and, and like like Dave's oven, it, that's that's referred to as a directly fired oven. It, the the flame, the source of heat, is in the same place that the that the bread is baked in that kind of oven. And um, you know, that, is yours insulated? Yeah. Right. So the next step, 
Yeah, some you know, people are baking hearth loaves like these rather than flatbreads. Uh, they'll take an oven like what Dave has and, and, uh, and then put a lot of insulation around it. And there are a lot of bakers in Vermont doing this. And fire it for several hours, sweep that fire out, uh, and, then, and then because of the mass, uh, and then outside of that, the insulation, that heat will radiate in for several hours, depending on how well the oven is built. It, it can really, people can bake for quite a, quite a few hours uh, just on that retained heat. Um, vermiculite is a common thing to use, or, um, you know, there's a, I mean, this oven has a lot of insulation too that's uh, rock wool. So those are the two that I know of uh, that are typically used. Of course, I don't know what they used in the old days. Uh, it's an interesting question. Well, fire bricks are the source of the thermal mass. You know, they don't really have an insulation value. Uh, so, yeah, perhaps soil dirt. It's an interesting question. Or perhaps they just got one bake out of it. I mean, have you have you baked uh, hearth breads in your oven? Yeah. So you know, if you, I once built an oven similar to that and without insulation, we could get one bake out of it. You know, of hearth breads. You know, sweep the fire out. And, and bake one round, but by that time it had lost 75 degrees or something like that, which you know means you wouldn't really want to put another load in there. But uh, Elmore Mountain Bakery, a small bakery up in, in Elmore, has a beautiful brick oven uh, with a whole lot of insulation on the outside. I've been there while they're loading the bread into the oven, and um, and then they then they unload it, and during that brief period that it's empty. They've got a race to get more bread in there because the temperature, they have uh, thermal couples in there that are monitoring the temperature, and you see the temperature going up because they've just taken the, the bread that was sucking some heat out, out of it, and the mass uh, is, is radiating that heat right back in there, you know, as if there was some source of heat there. But the only source of heat is, the, is what's left in the concrete and the bricks. Minimum temperature for baking? This kind of bread, 450. Yeah, you don't really want, and, you, and much more than 500 gets to be pretty tough, you know, so it's between 450 and 500. Um, yeah. So you want Yeah, yeah, yeah. same question. Yeah, yeah there's, uh, there's steam added to the, to the oven. This, there are down each side of, this is like four ovens stacked on top of each other. Um, so down the side, each side of each deck, uh, as we refer to it, but with their, their really like distinct ovens. There is uh, a whole bunch of cast iron in a trough and then a pipe with little holes in it that, um, that when, we, when we just hit a button, it sprays water onto the, the cast iron to create a 100% humidity environment for the first few minutes that the bread is being baked. In a, um, in a well-sealed, brick oven, you know, like the one I just described at Elmore Mountain, uh, they actually, it's so well sealed that the bread will, will steam itself. Uh, so this one, because we're opening it uh, in, more frequently, and I, I think really because it's, it's made with, with a lot of steel in there as well to, to create each chamber, it's just not sealed well enough for the bread to, to steam itself so well. But obviously the bread gives off a lot of moisture. Uh, so, so you just heard he just steamed it and it kind of whistled out there. Um, and this apparatus here is a is a loader that just makes it easy for us to get all the bread in at once. It's obviously efficient, but um, it's also a, a way of assuring that they're all spaced evenly, which means that they'll bake at the same rate. Um, but you, you know, the the old way, of course, of doing it is is to load it with a peel. Uh, big paddle like you see in American flatbread uh, and and scoop them off little by little. Uh, oh and yeah, the, the purpose of the moisture is to actually gelatinize the uh, the starches on the crust and so it, it uh, caramelizes more readily. It really colors up entirely differently when it's when it's steamed. It's a, it's the texture also, well, it's interesting, actually. It makes it chewier. Um, if you don't steam it, if we forget to steam it, it's more, it, it's actually a little thicker and, and, um, and harder uh, in, a, in a strange way. You're, you're always after the surface of the thread, and you can mark the water on it, or you can brush it with a brush, and you can get your own, and you can brush it with a brush, and you can get your own, 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 and you can
Yeah, yeah, it's true. And in this case, it's important that it be vapor, not water sprayed directly on there. Um, so, and the other, the other important thing is that because they're moistened right, right away, uh, it, it helps, so the crust is delayed in its formation in those first few minutes. And we have what we call oven spring. You know, the yeast goes through this, this frenetic activity when it gets into that high temperature in this last burst uh, we want to be as forceful as possible, and we don't want to be held back by that crust that, by that crust drying out at er any earlier than it needs to. So it really, you know, if, if we forget to, to steam it, we it uh, doesn't have nearly the, the caramelization. Uh, it gets to be this kind of hard, not very sweet uh, thing. It uh, and then also the loaves are are constricted. They so it, it actually affects the interior. When you when you forget to steam it, and that's also one of the reasons they cut it. Yeah, and that's yeah. Aside from decoration and identification, uh, it has a real practical function as well. Yeah, because it's gonna it's gonna want to burst somewhere uh, anyway, and and this just is a planned way, a, a way of making that happen in a in a predictable way. They've loaded the oven twice. Well, you've only been here for about five minutes, right? It does take about, depending on the loaf of bread, on the particular variety of bread, 35 or so minutes to 35 to 45 minutes. Um, but there's not the, it is a it is a cycle. It's a continuous cycle. Uh, he's he's, check, he's checking some ciabatta there. Uh, that's another seven or eight minutes away from. Did from, I use that from device yeah, yeah. You can use that in reverse and. Uh, and then they have to be transferred back onto, the, onto these cooling racks. Um. So as far as getting, getting moisture into an oven like Dave's, would it be wise to spray down the floor with a hose? Or yeah, people do that. Uh, uh, they generally do the, um, the, the roof, the top of the, of the with a with a hose, and people have reasonable success with that. Also, putting a um, uh, some kind of bowl in there, you know, like I w I sometimes wonder if it, if it would work to put you know a piece of cast a cast iron fry pan you don't care about in there, let it get uh, hot, and then and then spray some water onto that. Yeah, so you get that steam, that kind of thing. Ask it that one. Yeah. Uh, we make now because of the new regulations. We started making a, a bread specifically for the schools that is 60% um, the, the bolted flour. We sort of, I actually talked to the USDA about those regulations, and and, and they, I explained the whole bolted thing, and they they got it. To their credit, they said, okay, yeah, that makes sense. I, you know, that'll because the, the deal was. 50% whole grain, and I said, well, this has 0% whole grain, but, you know, the thing I said earlier about, it, but actually more, uh, yeah, and so at a rate of 60%, it's like getting, at least, you're getting everything you would if you had 50% whole wheat plus all the germ, and they went for that, so that's what we make now for the schools, uh, is it, it's a particular bread that uses the same starter that I just showed you. Um, and it's very similar formula to the Cyrus Pringle, it just has more of a bolted. So. Do you ever have to wash the windows? Yeah, we do. That's why we got the washing machine. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you, they'll build up mold. Yeah, but the, that's, we also have these custom racks made uh, that hold, each rung holds one cloth. So they'll dry out. I mean, it's just like anything else. You know, if you if you dry it and don't have it next to another one, uh, then the, the mold forms a lot less frequently. Yeah. Yeah, we scrape those. I mean, we brush those out at the end of every night, and then uh, it's not it only they only really require about once a year that we actually give them a wet wash. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't, it mostly, it's all about keeping things dry. Yeah. Brushing things out. Thank you. Yeah, well, we can, we can walk out through uh, this way. Hi, Don. All right, we're out here now. The hand-tied bag. <laughs>
Yeah, this is all this is all Ben's yeah. Ben's flour. give you a little of this starter. You should definitely make sure if you're getting any starter that you take this uh, formula, which of course I did in, I, I had done a, a few years ago for uh, a group that really wanted it uh, converted to cups, but um, I, I did that somewhat reluctantly because if the other thing that I meant to do is, uh, is, is bring out some of the books that we have, but um, if anybody's interested, you could, you could talk to me about I, I think the best book to get if you want, if you're interested in baking this type of bread, and, and if you don't have this one already, is Jeffrey Hamelman's book. He's the um, baker at King Arthur um, Bakery, and uh, he wrote a great book a number of years ago called Bread, uh, a baker's book of techniques and recipes. Uh, it's a very well written book, um, and would talk about weights and ways of methods and all of that kind of thing. Um, and I'm giving you this teeny little bit, because as I said, uh, you should add, you know, you should, you should uh, increase that by five times. And I also didn't completely seal that. Are you taking this? Great. Uh, I didn't completely seal that because it's, uh, it would blow its lid uh, if, it was, if it was sealed. So you wanted to breathe a little bit there. Unusable? Yeah, because it's not. It's in cups. Yeah, I know.